Hello and welcome back to Soteriology 101. As you can see, we have a guest with us today. This is Frank Turek. I appreciate Frank coming on today. Thanks for being here, brother. Hey, I'm getting a round of applause, man. Thanks for that intro. <laughs> This I have, toy, mate, and I got to start using you, you got to start playing with it. I mean, I've got to get this toy. I, I mean, I got that some cool toys. Scary if you got the toy, wait, really I think scary. my audience would start. Yeah, my audience would start. Okay, enough with the toys. Like, stop pushing the buttons. Like, I'm predestined uh, to push the buttons. You can't, you can't stop it. That's great. Well, for those that don't know, uh, Dr. Frank Turek, he is the president of Cross Examined. He's a great communicator. I, I don't say this about all of the apologists I have on the stage with unapologetics here at Texas Baptist. But I do say this about Frank. He is one of the best communicators. He brings very high lofty concepts down to where even I can understand them. And I love that about him. He's got a great YouTube channel with over 340,000 subscribers. You should check it out. Um, and here's a here's a fun fact about Frank you may not know. He is a former aviator in the U.S. Navy. My son, Cooper, is at the United States Naval Academy. So go oh, Navy good. beat Army. Yeah, so I, I I just wanted to give a shout out to the Navy since I he, saw that. What does he want to do, Leighton? Does he does he know what part of the Navy wants he went? Uh, he's taller than I am, so I doubt he'll go into aviation. He didn't oh. fit in the cockpits, but um, <laughs> see, but he uh, he he loves aviation. He loves a lot of the different aspects of it, and he's been he's been uh, researching. Matter of fact, this summer uh, he's going to do um, some training with the SEALs. Uh, he was one of thirty of all the midshipmen uh, that applied uh, over. A thousand midshipmen apply for this, and he he one of thirty that got in wow. to this this just the pre. It's not the pre training. He's not sure that he'll become a seal, but he, right. it's a pre training to kind of see what it would be like to be a seal. And so he's interested in that, and uh, he's one of the kind. He's one of those kids that's all his life has always looked for the hardest thing to do, and then he goes after goes after those well, things. I'll, and so I'll tell you, th there are some aircraft he could fit in, like the new P eight. I was in P threes, which was a land based turboprop that went out yeah. on submarines. It's been re been replaced by a P eight, which is a really a seven thirty seven. Uh, wow! And so he could do that. I don't know how tall is he. He's not like eight he's foot six, three, is he? He's not six four, six four, six five. Yeah, he could do um, it. Height, he could do it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, he's he's re researching that, and so that's that's a fun thing. When I saw that on your your bio, I thought, oh man, I, I got to talk to him about some Navy stuff. That's a, that's really cool. You know, Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. Does he know that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to share that. I'll share this video with him. Okay, to make sure good. You, he gets to know you. I'm sure. As a matter of fact, I think he's used some of your material before when he's talking to to Mormons. Uh, and, uh, he's, he's mentioned you as, as one of the people he's, he's listened to. So I, I know he already knows who you are. Uh, but I, I want our audience to know a little bit more about you, Frank, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more about you, maybe your own testimony, how you came to know Christ and then how, how did you become a, an apologist like you are today? Yeah, well, I was brought up, uh, in New Jersey in a Catholic home. I was Catholic because it's the law in New Jersey. You have to be Catholic. I don't know if you know that, <laughs> but, uh, I went to Catholic high school, uh, but, I, I'm, look, I always believed in God. I knew there had to be a first cause. And uh, mm -hmm. I was a fairly moral kid growing up. I didn't get into a lot of trouble. I always believed there was a God, but I never really knew who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And it may have been my fault. You know, you, you, there is a catechism in the Catholic Church. You know, they, they do teach you things like this, but it was never really explicit to me as to who Jesus was. And it wasn't mm -hmm. until uh, I went through college and got into the Navy uh, Nave, I went to flight school in, in Pensacola, Florida, navigator school. I was on the, on the navigator side of things. And I ran into the son of a Methodist minister and I had so many questions for him. He finally said, look, you just need to get Josh McDowell books, <laughs> evidence demands a verdict and more than a carpenter. Those were the two books written in the, you know, seventies yeah. or so. And this was Got like 1985. Yeah. And, uh, I read those books and, and became a Christian. I said, hey, this stuff is true. And after I got out of the Navy, I'm making a real long story short. After I got out of the Navy, I happened to run into Norman Geisler, who I didn't know it, but at the time was sort of the Michael Jordan of apologetics, you know, in, in about 19, when did we meet? We met in 1993, early 1993. And he had just started a seminary here in Charlotte called Southern Evangelical Seminary, SES.edu. Still, it's still going strong. And uh, so within six months, my wife and I and three sons, five, they were aged five, three and one. We moved from the D.C. area where I had my final duty station in the Navy to Charlotte, North Carolina, to go to Southern Evangelical Seminary. And uh, so I started going to seminary. It was very small at the time, you know, maybe 30, 40 students. And so 
uh, I learned a lot from Dr. Geiser to the point where he and I started to do seminars together. And then he and I uh, wrote a couple of books together. One's called Legislating Morality. The other's called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And uh, then in uh, 2006, we started, or I did, I started crossexamine.org to go to colleges, high schools, and churches because 75% of the kids who are brought up in church walk away from the church once they leave the home. Now we know many of them check out mentally before they even go to college because yeah. we don't teach them why Christianity is true. So our ministry is devoted to going to colleges, high schools, and churches to present to people why Christianity is true. So that's how I got into this. I came to mm. faith through apologetics and wanted to get into it when I ran into Dr. Norman Geisler. Gotcha. Well, you oh, know, by the way, Leighton, I, I got to mention yeah. this. You already know this, but maybe your your colleagues yeah. or your viewers might not know. He, uh, Dr. Geisler is the one that wrote the book Chosen But Free. Well, and I, I was going to just mention that that obviously with uh, this particular broadcast, we we focus on soteriology and a speci specifically, you know, my own journey out of Calvinism and why mm -hmm. why theologically we disagree with Calvinists. It's it's uh, it's one of those things we're trying to fill in the gap of the absence on the internet of of materials like this, where we go through texts that are often interpreted Calvinistically and those kinds right. of things. And so uh, I, I think for our audience's benefit, uh, you know, I know many of them express frustration because it seems like everywhere they turn, people are Calvinists. Uh, most of the, the, the speakers and the books, and uh, it seems like it's everywhere. And so are you a Calvinist? Were you ever a Calvinist? Obviously, it doesn't seem like it. you were influenced by a Methodist and then uh, McDowell, which I know is not a Calvinist, and then Geisler, who, as you just mentioned, uh, wrote a book on the subject, who is not a Calvinist. So I guess God didn't predestine you to become I a Calvinist. I was never so. predestined to be a Calvinist. <laughs> and I always had I questions that. for Dr. Geisler on it. And I remember sitting in his living room one day and the light bulb went off when he just said one thing about this. And it had to do with, God's sovereignty and man's free will. And basically what he said was that God knows in advance everything we're going to do. That's unavoidable if God is all knowledge, and he is. Whatever universe God creates, he knows how it's going to turn out. But that doesn't mean he's causing us directly to do what we do. We can still have free will. In other words, yes, we are chosen. When God elects to create this universe, he elects the outcome. But that doesn't mean he's causing us to do what we do. We, he's electing an outcome based on our free will. He already knows what we're going to do. So we are chosen but free, hence the title of his book, Chosen But Free. So the light bulb went off when he said that, that basically knowledge does not imply causation. Just because you know something doesn't mean you're causing somebody else to do it. I, I give many illustrations to try and illustrate this. Uh, for example, if a, if a mother puts down her baby uh, who she just brought home from the hospital for, you know, to, to, to sleep one night, she knows at some point that baby is going to wake up and want to eat that night. But because she knows that that baby is going to wake up, does that mean she's causing the baby to wake up? Well, obviously not, right? Just because she knows it doesn't mean she's causing it. I, I can know that the sun's going to rise in the east tomorrow. That doesn't mean I'm causing it to rise in the east. I mean, there, there there's so many... There are so many um, examples of this that it amazes me that people think, well, if God knows it, then he must be causing it. No, not the case. Yeah. I, I think William Lane Craig talks about that pretty well, too. He talks mm -hmm. about necessity versus certainty. Something can be certainly known without being necessitated or determined by the right. one who knows it. Um, and, and, and I understand I understand the complexity of that issue. I mean, I, I've grappled with it myself over the years. Uh, you know, if God knows everything before he creates it, and he creates it knowing exactly what's going to happen. Then that means he ultimately determined that thing to happen. And therefore, I couldn't do anything other than what he uh, created for me to do. Uh, and you kind of go down this spiral of philosophical, uh, you know, logical conclusions based upon our own finite reasoning. And and I, the, the way that I push back against that now is just to ask the Calvinist friend, do you think if God wanted to create a creature that he himself doesn't determine his moral choices. Do you think it's within his capacity to pull that off, even though you might not be able to fathom how he does it? Right. Um, and I would think most Calvinists uh, would would be willing to at least acknowledge that God could accomplish that. His power of omniscience shouldn't be a deterrent for him. In other words, it shouldn't be a, a handicap for him uh, to say that because he has that much power, because he has that much knowledge, therefore he can't do something that even you and I could pull off. Like you already mentioned with the, the examples you gave, even I can know something that's going to happen without being the determiner of it. Surely God can, uh, create creatures that he doesn't himself determine. 
Uh, and that certainly seems to be a more biblical, uh, biblically uh, accurate way of looking at the way in which God at least treats us um, as if we're not determined. Uh, and, and if nothing else, that, that should be enough uh, to, to push us that direction. But here, here's where the kind of the rubber meets the road, Frank. What does it matter? Uh, mm -hmm. I know we have friends, we have mutual friends that we've mm -hmm. we've met with and worked with recently in a, in a mutual conference together who we love, who lean Calvinistically and are unapologetically call themselves Calvinists. Um, and we work together side by side to teach people apologetics, in fact. Um, so does it really matter what you believe about free will, uh, predestination, Calvinism or not, uh, when you're doing apologetics? Yeah, well, ironically, let me go back to something you said earlier. Ironically, I think that Calvinists don't take God's sovereignty seriously enough. Why? Because I think that God is so sovereign that he can get his will done through our free will. Hmm. And apparently Calvinists don't think that. <laughs> you know, Calvinists think, oh, if God is sovereign, he can't give us free will. Or he, at least he can't give us free will when it comes to choosing uh, whether or not we're saved. I've heard R.C. Sproul, whom I loved, by the way. I, I, I listen to R.C. Sproul all the time. But I, I heard him saying that, yeah, we do have free will, except when it comes to choosing whether or not we're Christians. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you know, that, that's like the most important decision we can make. And that's the one yeah. thing that we can't choose. Well, why is that? I don't, I don't understand. Do you think that God is not sovereign enough to get his will done through our free will? Yeah, that's really a good way of putting it. Yeah, I think he is sovereign enough to do that. But let me go back to your question. Why does it matter? Uh, you know, we've had conversations with mutual friends, as you've said. And to be honest about uh, looking at the scriptures, I think Calvinists can make a case from the scriptures and interpret them in a Calvinistic way. I don't think they're totally out to lunch when they do that. But what I do say to them is, yeah, you could interpret it that way. I think you're interpreting it wrongly when you interpret it that way. But you could make a case to interpret it that way. But why would you interpret it that way when it makes, A, God the author of evil, because now we don't have free choice and God makes all our choices, including our choice to do evil, and secondly takes away the free will of man. When you see other passages that say God wants all to be saved and you know, I'm going to, I don't know about you, but in my house, we're going to choose the Lord. And, you know, in verses like this or passages like this, uh, which seem to take away all human responsibility away. Why would you interpret it in a way that makes God the author, author of evil and takes human responsibility away? I, I, I don't get that because you can easily interpret it in what I think is the proper way to say that, yes, God chooses. We all know God chooses. That's that's unavoidable, Leighton, as you know. It's unavoidable yeah. that God makes choices. And when he knows all things and when he chooses to create this universe, he is going to choose the outcome because he knows how it's going to turn out. But as we said earlier, that doesn't mean he's taking away our free will. Yes, he chooses, but we still freely do what we do. Yeah, and I know a lot of Calvinists will kind of redefine free will um, in such a way as to say, you know, it's called compatibilism. That, mm -hmm. can, that God's determinism is true. God determines everything, but that's compatible with human freedom, How? Uh, human, human responsibility. How? And they, what they do is they say, well, freedom is defined as as long as you're doing what you want to do. Now, underneath that is obviously God's the one who determines what you want to do <laughs> in any given right. circumstance that God determines. No, it's but not really that, free will. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a non-free free will is what yeah. Ken Kilden Wilson, who I'm having on Monday, he, he, that's what he calls it. It's a non-free free will. It's a, it, they call it compatibilistic free will instead of libertarian free will. And that's why mm -hmm. we have all these, these terms uh, in the philosophical world, because you've got to be able to define these things. But th that, I, I, I don't, when, whenever you define free will that way, you, as long as you're doing what you want, you're free and you're responsible, even though God has determined what you want to do and you're just not supposed to ask any questions. And if you do ask, well, then why, uh, why are we to be blamed for that? That's when they quote, you know, Romans 9 at you. Uh, out of context, in my estimation, because they say, well, that's exactly what the interlocutor in, in Paul's mind is asking. Why are we to be blamed for doing what he has created us and molded us in, as a potter to do? And then, of course, I've got to go back over 
the lesson in Romans 9 as to what Paul is actually talking about, a rebellious, hardened Israelite, mm -hmm. uh, not somebody who was born a reprobate, and mm -hmm. they were cut off because of their unbelief and being hardened judicially by God to bring about the crucifixion and the engrafting of the Gentiles. It's not about reprobation. Mm -hmm. It's about judicial hardening of Israel. And once I explain that, then the, the back and forth fireworks over how do you interpret this text comes apart. But I think you said something really important. I want to I want to hone in on this. If you have two viable options in front of you, two viable interpretations in front of you, one, one of which has actually been more popular throughout Christian history among scholars, uh, namely the, the view that we hold to, the more uh, free will perspective, if you will, uh, has always been more popular throughout church history than the, the more predestinarian uh, or uh, deterministic mm -hmm. kind of interpretations. If you have both of those in front of you and you're, and you're actually studying the best of both scholars from both sides, why would you choose the one mm -hmm. that seems to make God the author of sin, that seems to impugn his character, that seems to possibly undermine other very strong texts that indicate God's frustration for when we don't choose to follow him and and the, the wrath of God and the punishment of God for doing things that he's supposedly determined for you to do that you couldn't help? I don't it, know why they— seems, yeah. I, know, I was going to say, I don't know why they choose it late, and I can speculate. It might be because it's easier. <clears throat> Right. And it might easier in the sense that, well, look, these people are just on their way to hell. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, I, I'll throw a Bible verse at them, see if, you know, see if if maybe they'll respond. I don't know if they're elect or not, but, gee, if they don't respond, I guess they're just not elect. So uh, I, I don't really have the 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 motivation for evangelism like I should. Right. If that's the case, it might just be easier to say I can explain this. God just hasn't selected them. But and, and it also makes me feel better. Well, he selected me, right? Mm -hmm. He selected me, and I don't really have any free choice in it. But, gee, I'm pretty special now, okay? I, I'm speculating. I, I'm not a Calvinist, so I don't yeah. know what's in their head. Maybe it might, it, it, it might be that they've never heard the other side. That could be the case. Maybe they haven't turned into, they're tuned into Soteriology 101. Yeah. Well, I think if, you know, back when I was a Calvinist, I would think it was probably the latter. I hadn't really been introduced to the other mm -hmm. side. And therefore, I adopted that interpretation because it was the one introduced to me uh, first, and and so uh, that that's the and that's the reason that I adopted it. I didn't. I don't think I ever had the motivation of being lazy or trying to avoid evangelism when I was a Calvinist. I don't ever remember that being, uh, you know, a motivation. Uh, th though it could be the motivation of some, I have no idea. We can't we can't read the minds of of Calvinists as to why they choose one particular interpretation over another. It's just been my experience in the time doing this that very few of, especially the young internet type Calvinists. Um, have actually given time to really uh, examine the deep theological robust scholars from the mm. other side. Yeah. They, they have mostly kind of surrounded themselves in an echo chamber of other Calvinists telling them what the other side believes. And that's one of the reasons they treat us like we're doofuses sometimes <laughs> is because they just assume that we're, we're as dumb as uh, the, the, the scholars and the leaders within their world, their community are, are telling them about us. And, and that's one of the reasons I started the program is to say, hey, there's some really sharp guys like Dr. Turek and, and many, many others who do not hold to a, a more deterministic reading of the text. And, and, and this is where I think the rubber meets the road when it comes to apologetics. Um, you mentioned this just now about the motivation to do apologetics. Mm -hmm. If you believe God is ultimately deciding what the person you're talking to is going to decide with regard to their faith, then what motivates you to spend all day long, as Paul does in Acts chapter 28, right. trying to persuade them? Right. Um, what what motivates you to go through all of the evidences instead of just saying, hey, Jesus died on the cross. If you would believe in him, you'll be saved and just leaving it at that. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. a Calvinist, you can obey the command to tell the good news, but not even get involved in apologetics. So uh, that would be my big question is what's the motivation of being an apologist to begin with? if you're going to adopt the Calvinistic system. And I would might add this too, Leighton, that if uh, God, I, I think God gives us partially anyway, not to a full extent, but he gives us the dignity of causality. What do I mean by that? That God gives us the ability to affect not only time, but eternity with what we do. And hmm. if God does it all, then why are we even here? <laughs> I mean, yeah. he doesn't need us to preach the gospel if he determines without overrides the free will of human beings. He doesn't need us to do a thing, right? But he yeah. does, if we do have free will, he gives us the opportunity uh, to actually affect time and eternity. 
You know, uh, I'm reminded of a debate years ago at Dallas Theological Seminary that my mentor, Dr. Norman Geiser, had with Dr. John Gerstner, who Geiser described as the reincarnation of Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And they were having a debate over this very issue. And according to Geiser, I, I never got Gerstner's side of it, but according to Geiser, here's what happened in one of the exchanges. Uh, Dr. Geisler turned to Gerstner, and of course, Geisler is, is giving our view, the fact that we're chosen but free, and Gerstner is the five-point Calvinist, and he turns to Gerstner and he says, does man have free will? And Gerstner says, yes, well, man has free will to do what he desires, but right. God gives him the desires of his heart. And so Geisler turned to Gerstner and said, well, then who gave Lucifer the desire to sin? And Gerstner said, mystery, and Geisler said, contradiction. You see, even R.C. Sproul would, when he got to that point, he would just say mystery. And R.C. Yeah. Sproul was was one of the most brilliant philosophers out there. He would just say mystery. When the reality is it's a contradiction to say that God is all good, yet he gives his creatures the desire to do evil. He takes away their free will, the desire to do evil, and then they act on that. That's not the God of the Bible. That's, that's Allah, okay? Mm. God is not uh, essentially good. Whatever God does is good. That's Allah. Mm. That's voluntarism. That's not essentialism. There's no ground of goodness if the five-point Calvinist God is the God of the Bible. Uh, mm. it, that's, that, 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 that just results in volunt- a voluntaristic Allah. Whatever God mm. does is good. So I, I, I've, uh, I've heard some people even describe the God of the five point Calvinist as Allah. Now, of course, they would push back on that and make some some modifications somehow. But I think that's inevitably where it leads, Leighton. It leads to a God who's arbitrary. Um, I, I would love to get a, a record of that conversation between. Is it, do you know if it's recorded between Geisler? I, I have no and idea. Gerstner? This is probably. See, Geisler was there. When was he there? He was there in the 80s. So I don't know if it was recorded. Um, I don't know if English. it was recorded on a cassette. You remember those? Yeah. You're, 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 you're not as old <laughs> I'm as I'm old enough. I'm you old enough remember to remember the cassettes. Yes, I'm, I'm quite, quite, quite. Okay, maybe it was. Maybe it was on. Maybe it was on eight track. Yes, well, I used to get the Ligonier. I get the Ligonier tapes in the mail. You know, okay. the Ligonier from Ligonier Ministries from R.C. Uh-huh. Sproul, and and sometimes if they got caught in my thing, you know, you had to get it with a pencil and you know f- fix it. <laughs> you know, right. that was your repair. Your repair kit was a pencil. Uh-huh. But um, but yeah, the the. That conversation is great because that's one I actually quote from Sproul and Piper, both appealing to the mystery of the first sin um, because of that very point. Because the point I'm making is that they're kind of kicking their the can down the road because they appeal to the same mystery we do with regard to free will. They just they just appealed to it earlier on. Um, and and that's one of the reasons that stricter Calvinist or higher Calvinist, um, they come right out and say God is the one who determined Adam's sin. And uh, in the garden is just like Lucifer's sin. They'll just come right out and say it. Um because they recognize the inconsistency of that kind of position. Well, whereas, we, we, yeah, we might say he determined it, but he didn't cause it. Right. Can we say the, that the causal determination. Yeah. yeah. Well, determine, determining in the sense of, and this is where some people get into uh, the, the, the uh, semantics of what, what is determinism and what is uh, yeah. causal determination versus allowing something to happen. Obviously right. you can say he determined to allow something to happen. In other words, he determined for Pearson to make a free choice. I, I love, uh, what is A.W. Tozer's quote where he says something, God in his sovereignty did not determine which choice you'll make, but that you'll be free to make it. Therefore, when you make a free choice, you're not countervailing the sovereign will of God, but actually fulfilling it insofar Mm as he's not determining your choice, but that you'll be free. And a God less than sovereign would be afraid to grant creatures that amount of freedom because he wouldn't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And I'm paraphrasing, but basically he made the same argument that you were making earlier is I, I think our view of sovereignty is much higher than that of the determinist determinist uh, perspective of a Calvinist because ultimately God is having to play both sides of the chessboard in order to ensure his victory versus uh, God's just better at chess than all of his opponents. Um, and th- that's how we know he's going to win because he's just better at, at, at chess. No matter what moves mm-hmm. his opponents make, he's always going to be able to accomplish his purpose through uh, their, their free choices. And let like me, you were, you were arguing earlier. Let me go back to your question because there's another implication to this. You asked, what are the implications of being an apologist and being a Calvinist? For me, uh, I've noticed that when Calvinists who are apologists try and answer questions regarding evil, they they can't give a robust answer because uh, 
someone who believes as we do that man has free will, that God still chooses, but we still have free will. We still choose as well. We're chosen but free. We can answer the problem of evil in a much more robust manner. They can't. Uh, you know, people will ask, well, why did God allow Satan to sin? And the Calvinists will say, well, they're going to have to say, well, God didn't just allow it. He wanted him to sin. He, he gave him the, the impetus to sin, like he gives us the impetus to sin and the impetus to choose him. So uh, uh, someone who believes in free will can say the reason God allows evil is because he wants this to be a moral universe. So he gives us free choice. The only way we can love and make moral choices is if we have some sort of libertarian free will. But that opens up the possibility for us to do evil as well. And God thought it was worth having a moral universe. He thought love was, was worth giving people free will so they could love, but that opens up the possibility for evil. Uh, he right. could have made a robot world, which maybe I'm characterizing it too uncharitably, but that seems to me what Calvinism is, at least a hard five-point version. He could have created a robot world where we re really don't have free will, but it seems to me that's not a loving world. That's not a moral world. But God thought it was worth allowing free will so he could give us the ability to love and he could solve the problem of evil by taking it upon himself. That he comes mm. into this universe and allows the very creatures that freely chose to sin against him to torture and kill him so he could take their punishment on himself and then offer salvation back to them. Mm. That seems to make much more sense of the problem of evil than just saying, well, God determines all thing and things, and it's a mystery as to why evil exists. Yeah, and it, and it becomes seemingly incoherent because you've got God redeeming his own determination. So he determines yeah. evil to happen, and he redeems that what he determined. At least he redeems some of the things that he determined to happen, and other things he doesn't redeem because uh, the reprobates aren't redeemed. Mm -hmm. And he determined for their nature to be such that they could only reject the gospel from birth. Uh, that 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 seems to the the incoherence and the the intuitive. Uh, feeling deep within that even R.C. Sproul testifies to feeling when he first was introduced to Calvinism, this intuitive repulsion to the lack of seeming justice of God to do this kind of thing to creation pushes back against this. But yet there's so many people who still have adopted this particular way of thinking in this particular worldview, especially uh, right now in our culture, Calvinism happens to be resurging in popularity. Um, it may be starting to wane a little bit now, um, uh, some, some may say, but uh, you, you can't argue with the fact that even, even the New York Times did an article about it uh, back in 2014 about the resurging of Calvinism. And it does seem like every theology book that you pick up or the, every video that you watch, if you type in these kinds of questions on Google, you get uh, you get Lingonier and you get Grace to You Ministries, which is MacArthur's ministry, and you get uh, John Piper's ministry, Desiring God, and you get Got Questions, which they do lean hi highly Calvinistically and you rely upon Calvinistic sources, and uh, and and uh, the Gospel Coalition and Nine Marks, and uh, the list could go on and mm -hmm. on and on. And one one of the things that that I'm striving to do is to highlight scholars like yourself um, and and many many others who have been teaching what I believe is true biblical theology and soteriology for, for years and years, all the way back from the early church fathers, um, a, a very uh, uh, consistent way of understanding human responsibility and what you just described as a, a proper biblical theodicy. Um, but sometimes you can't help for, but feel somewhat discouraged as a Christian when, when you see the rise of this, especially if it's as serious as what you you just described, and this is the question I'll pose to you, Frank. And this is this is a hard question. I get this question a lot. Um, if if the God that's being described by Calvinists is like you you, you mentioned, uh, more like Allah uh, in a lot of ways, in the way that Allah is described by by the Islamic community, um, if, if it's uh, really making God the author of sin, then how is it that we can say? Um, that we have friends who are Calvinist and that we get along with them and all these kinds of things. Uh, aren't, aren't you saying, therefore, if they believe in this, this God who believes all these things and does all these things, therefore, they must not be a Christian. Therefore, we can't really fellowship with them. Therefore, we need to get angry with them more and we need to shout them out and throw them out the kingdom, um, which obviously neither one of 
you or I do. This is one of the reasons this yeah. question is brought to me quite often is why, why aren't you meaner with the Calvinists? Why don't you call them a heretic that they are and cast them out of the kingdom? And so I'll, I'll pose that question to you. Why don't you cast out your Calvinist brothers uh, out of the kingdom uh, and shout right. them down as being heretics? Yeah, because I, I think that not every person that believes in Calvinism recognizes it its long-term implications, right? Just because you might believe something doesn't mean you've thought it all the way through to its logical conclusion. I mean, there may be some beliefs I have that I haven't thought all the way through, and, and then I back up and I go, wow, yeah, if I believe this, then if you continue down that logical road, you're, you're going to arrive here. Maybe this belief that I have way back here uh, is wrong, and I need to I need to reevaluate it. It might be that these people are brothers and sisters in Christ, and they haven't really gotten into studying this. You know, I've read books on it. You know, many people haven't. And so maybe they haven't thought of the logical implications of it. And mm -hmm. so I'm not going to separate from them because they're still out there being brothers and sisters in the Lord. They still believe in sin. They still believe in the essentials of the faith. There is a God. You are not him. You're fallen. You need to accept Christ. He's the Savior. You're saved by grace, not by works. You know, we all believe in that Christ is going to come back. And so they believe in all the essentials of the faith, but the implications of Calvinism prevents them from, I think, answering some of the hardest questions about the faith. Hmm. That's, that's one of the problems. And it might be that they never get questions, or it might be that they have to stop short of a real robust answer because of the implications of their Calvinism, but they're still Christians. Right. Yeah. Well said. Well so, yeah. Said. So the, the the implications aren't always thought through. That's part of the issue. And I think one of the reasons for this, if 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 I may say, Leighton, is we haven't been taught proper biblical interpretation because we haven't been taught proper philosophy. Oh, you you can't use philosophy to judge the text. You can't. That's vain philosophy. Paul warns against that. Can we talk about that for a minute? Please. Okay. I'd love to hear I'd love to hear more about that. I had an interaction once with a Calvinist. I'm, I'm going to leave names out of it because that just makes people side with personality. This you. is not a personality yeah. thing, okay? This is a, a, a logic thing. And um, I had said to somebody who had asked me a question about this Calvinist who was trying to say that you can't use philosophy to interpret the text. I said, well, about this person, I said, it doesn't appear that he understands that while it's possible to use bad philosophy to interpret the text, it's impossible to use no philosophy to interpret the text. <laughs> well said. And, and so this individual forwarded my, my answer to his emailed question to this Calvinist, who then contacted me and said, well... Uh, I'm just using the historical grammatical method to interpret the scriptures. And so I responded to him by saying, where is the historical grammatical method taught in the scriptures? And if it is taught, how would you get that principle out of the scriptures without using some philosophical Plus. principles to understand that's what the, 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 the Bible is teaching? And he wouldn't answer the question. Why? Because there's no answer to the question. He's mm. using philosophy just like everybody else. And so if we don't learn proper prolegomena, I don't know if people understand what that means. That's what you do before you can do theology. What's prolegomena? It's what it's the things you have to know before you can even interpret the Bible or anything else. You can't interpret the newspaper. Nobody knows what a newspaper is. You can't even interpret the Internet, what's written in front of you, without philosophy, much less the Bible. And I normally give people this, this illustration of this, Leighton. In fact, when I get this question on college campuses, normally I get the question on, you know, um, I just had it the other night. I was at Boise State University, and, and a young man, you can see all this on our YouTube channel, Cross Examine YouTube channel. Look at the Boise State. Fast forward to the, nearly the end of the – he was one of the last questions – and he said something like, um, how do you how do you how can you use man's reason to uh, interpret the scriptures? Aren't you just supposed to interpret what the Bible says by what it says? You know, like, aren't you just supposed to rely on God's word, not man's reason? Right. Now, now, that sounds so 
That pious. sounds so pious, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. The problem is there's no such thing as man's reason. <laughs> there's just reason, okay? <laughs> and you you can't understand. And I gave him this illustration because it had to do with the age of the universe, which is a whole other topic I don't want to get into now. But I said, let me ask you a question. What does the first verse of the Bible say? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, what does that verse assume you already know? First of all, it assumes you know language, right? You got to know language to even know what that means. Second are you all, saying language? Are you saying language is more important than God's holy word? That's what you're. <laughs> that's what you're. See, I can. I, you can make anything pious, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. But God's holy word is written in language, and <laughs> exactly. for you to know what it means, you got to know what language means, right? Exactly. Secondly, you have to know grammar, right? Uh, you also have to know in the beginning. You have to know what a beginning. What is what does beginning mean? You also have to have some idea of what God means, right? God is not explained. He's assumed in the beginning. God created. God is create God. Who's this God character and created? What does created mean? It, it presupposes, you know, cause and effect, the heavens and the earth. It presupposes, you know, about a universe. So what is this one verse already presupposing, you know, it presupposes, you know, grammar. It presupposes, you know, language. It presupposes, you know, logic. It presupposes, you know, what beginning means. It presupposes you have some idea of what God means and that he's some sort of creator. It presupposes, you know, cause and effect, that things don't happen without a cause, right? This mm. is what you bring to the text in order to understand what the text means. This is not even taught in the text. Why? Because you would need these principles if it was taught in the text for you to get that that knowledge out of the text. Right. So most seminaries today, unfortunately, don't teach prolegomena. Pro prolegomena. They don't teach philosophy and these kinds of principles, yet they're necessary for you to understand anything. And, mm. and so those principles, which are called natural revelation, because God has written two books. He's written, yes, the Bible, but he's also written the book of nature. And in order to understand the Bible, you need to understand the book of nature first. You, mm. you can't understand the Bible without the book of nature. And, and, and so these are principles you need to apply to the text. Now, once you know these principles, then you can understand the, the, the scriptures more clearly and more accurately. And I think sometimes... Unfortunately, our Reformed friends haven't been taught this, at least at least not explicitly, and that's why they run into problems when they get to passages like Romans 9. They haven't been taught yeah. proper philosophical hermeneutical principles. And we, I, I hope we can talk about Romans 9, because I think, I think that's something that, that is probably more often brought up for the Calvinistic view than, than any other scriptures. Oh sure, we can definitely. I, I wrote a book on that one, so I, yeah, I love I love talking Romans nine, um, but I, I do want to kind of emphasize just real quickly on your philosophical point mm -hmm. because I think that's so valuable. Because more times than not, in discussions like this, especially online type of discussions, which aren't always the most fruitful uh, ways to interact with mm -hmm. people, I, I always recommend getting face to face with people. Um, and usually when I'm doing back and forth, that's usually when it starts getting heated, that's usually what I'll say is, hey, can we have a discussion? Can we talk? Right, right. Because it, that, that'll immediately uh, can cool things down when you see people face to face and see them as a real person versus just some, you know, nebulous uh, thing on the other side of the uh, the computer screen. But um, the, the, the biggest point that comes up in these kinds of things is that kind of pious, you're using man's philosophy. Um, and usually that, that comes from someone who doesn't who doesn't have enough self awareness to recognize their philosophy is just as just as much from man as the one you're accusing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you're you're both men or women. You're, you're humans, right. and so whatever reason you have is, can be called human philosophy or human reasoning. It's 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 which one is is the correct one? Which which right. approach is the correct one? And so it's a it's a form of question begging, if you will. Anytime you mm -hmm. can, anytime, anytime you can repeat an argument back to your opponent. And not change a word, just repeat it right back. You're using man's philosophy, and they can just turn around and go, "You're using man's philosophy." That's just a question begging argument, and it's fruitless. And it's used it's used by those who are trying to out pious their opponent. And Christians are really bad about that, where they try to make themselves seem more pious by accusing their opponent of doing something that they themselves very likely are doing without even recognizing it. And so, I want our audience to really listen to what you just said because I think you said it so. Uh, well to explain that all of us are using human philosophy the question is are we are we using good philosophy 
good logic, good reason, because God is the author of reason and yes. logic. His nature. And, uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Our ability to reason comes from him. So it's not really man's philosophy. What Paul means in, in Colossians 2.8 is vain philosophy, that using uh, our own ideas rather than the truth that comes from God. And so, yes, as I said before, it is possible to use bad philosophy to interpret the text, but it's impossible to use no philosophy. Everyone is applying principles of reason and logic yeah. and cause and effect to the text in order to understand what it really means. And uh, an another aspect of this is the, the, the a, a Bible verse can't mean now what it didn't mean then. Hmm. All right. Yeah. We, we're trying to get our, or let me put it another way. We're trying to get the meaning from the text into our heads. That's proper exegesis. We're not trying to put our meaning onto the text. That would be eisegesis. If you're, re this is why I tell people, I, I was just preaching at church last week. I said, if you're ever in a Bible study and somebody says, hey, Ed, hey, Mary, what does this verse mean to you? You ought to say, it doesn't matter what it means to me. It, matter mm -hmm. what it, it matters what it meant to Paul or to Jesus or to, or to, to, to Moses, or whoever we're talking about, right? Whoever's right. speaking in the text, that's who it matters to. If you're trying to get your meaning into the text or your meaning out of the text, you're not reading God's word. You're reading your own. You yeah. want to get God's word, which means you want to figure out what the meaning is from the text. And right. I think too often we're not taught those principles. And what I tell audiences who, who they, when they bring up Bible verses, I say, there are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. And you think when, when say, a uh, Paul is writing Romans 9, or the book of Romans, he said, here's chapter 9, verse 1. No, those <laughs> chapter and verse divisions were added 500 mm -hmm. years ago to help us navigate the text, which is important, right? Because it's a yeah. big, long series of documents. Imagine if you didn't have numbers in there, and you went to church one Sunday, and the pastor said, hey, let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot, right? Now, you couldn't do that, right? You need numbers, <laughs> The problem is people tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, they can take it out and make it say whatever they want. This is yep. why I always tell people, look, Jeremiah 29, 11 does not apply to you. OK, unless you're 2600 years old and you're living under Nebuchadnezzar in present day Iraq and you're waiting to go mm -hmm. back to the Holy Land. Jeremiah 29, 11, all oh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. That does not apply to you. And they're going, what? You've got to look at the context of the passage. That's written to exiles uh, from 2,600 years ago. It's not written to us. And if you're going to quote Jeremiah 29, 11 as applying to you, why don't you quote Jeremiah 44, 11? Because you see, Jeremiah 29, 11 is to the exiles that went to Babylon. Jeremiah 44, 11 is to the exiles that went to Egypt. And God said, don't go to Egypt. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? It says, I will destroy you in all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow, right? You don't see that on a birthday card. You get a birthday card. It goes, happy birthday. I will destroy you in all Judah, Jeremiah 44, 11. Oh, thanks, Grandma. That is so sweet. Right? You don't see that because people don't know how to interpret the Bible. They just pick and choose what they want. So when we look at Romans 9, we got to know the context. Yeah, so I'll let me put on my Calvinistic hat here okay. and, and and just say, okay, if a Calvinist is coming at you and say, well, obviously, Frank, the Bible says, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. Uh -huh. This is before they were ever born, before uh -huh. they did anything good or bad. Uh -huh. And so obviously God loves some people and he hates other people. And you're, who mm -hmm. are you to question if God does that? Because he even goes on to say, he's the potter. He can make some pots mm -hmm. for noble purposes and some for common, which means he can make some people for salvation and some people for damnation. And obviously... Esau was made for damnation before he was ever born. That's what God created him for. And Jacob was created for salvation, and that's what he was created for. And if he wants to make some people to reprobate them and stomp all over them for his glory to be known, just to who are you to question the potter for making some clay pots to destroy them, to show how powerful he is over, over them? And if he wants to show mercy to people who are unworthy like you and I, um, how are you to question God is obviously right there in black and white in Romans nine. Are you just, are you just refusing to even read the text, Frank? Yeah. You see, as a Calvinist, I could say, you're right. God loves me and he hates you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're done. <laughs> right. But I'd say, okay, first of all, 
let's look at the book of Romans as a whole. All right. What is the book of Romans? Well, it's a theological treatise, if you will. It's the most comprehensive theological book in, I think, the entire Bible as to what Christianity is all about. And Paul lays it out in four basic acts. He goes from condemnation in the first couple of chapters to justification in chapter 3, verse 20, to sanctification beginning about chapter 6, to glorification halfway through chapter 8. And it would have made perfect sense for Paul in, if you read the end of chapter 8, where he says, nothing's going to separate us from the love of God, right? It would make perfect sense to go right from there to chapter 12 and say, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, right? He does all this theology for eight chapters. It would have made perfect sense to go right to chapter 12 and say, therefore, just, just give it up for God, you know? Just mm -hmm. let's apply all this now. But he doesn't. He stops and he has a three chapter with chapter divisions we put in later, but a three chapter detour to say, oh, you're reading this in Rome and you're probably thinking, if all this is true, how come the Jews haven't become Christians? And so he talks about in Romans chapter nine, Israel's past. Then in Romans chapter 10, Israel's present. And then in Romans chapter 11, Israel's future. Okay. Well so here, this is the big picture. You just can't zero in on one verse. And so let's go to chapter nine for a second. And with the, I know you've done this in a book and you've done it in other videos. Sure. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. I love, I love people to hear uh, other voices because that, I, I think it strengthens the case. So please yeah. keep going. I love let's it. pick it up here in verse 11. He says, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order to, in order that God's purpose in election might stand Time out. Okay. What does the word election mean here? Because there are two kinds of elections in the Bible. There is election to salvation, and I believe in election to salvation, but as I said earlier, we're still, we're still freely choosing whether we're going to accept Christ or not, because by definition, whenever God creates a universe, he knows how it's going to turn out, because he's all-knowing, right? It's unavoidable for God, okay? So I believe in election, individual election to salvation, but I don't think it's against our free will. It's in accord with our free will. But there's another kind of election. It's the election of the nation of Israel, and that kind of election took place long before Paul talked about predestination in Ephesians chapter 1. And so if Paul's talking about Israel here, I mean, the very first verse of chapter 9 talks about what about my brothers? He's talking about Israel right away, right? right. So he says, God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all. Now, this quotation, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, is not from Genesis, it's from Malachi. He's talking about the election of the nation of Israel. And he goes on to say, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, compassion on whom I have passion. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. What doesn't depend on, on, on man's desire or effort, but God's mercy? God's election of the nation of Israel. And then he says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose. I might display my power in you that my name might be proclaimed to all the earth. And he says, I'll have mercy on whom I want to have mercy and I harden whom I want to harden. OK, let's stop right here. Why is Paul using this um, language harden? Well, he's quoting from Moses. Why is Moses using the language harden? It shows that Moses knows the culture of Egypt. What's the culture of Egypt? A pharaoh could only make it to the afterlife if his heart was weighed against a feather in the afterlife. If his heart was clean, in other words, he wasn't, he didn't sin, then the feather would outweigh the heart and the pharaoh would be admitted to the afterlife. But if he was a bad pharaoh, if he did evil and his heart outweighed the feather, that would mean that his heart was consumed by this combination uh, uh, alligator, hippopotamus a bean that would consume his heart and the pharaoh would not be admitted to heaven if his heart was, was heavy. Well, how could Moses communicate in, in Exodus that pharaoh was evil? To say his heart was hard, that his heart had gotten heavy, and he, was being he would be consumed in the afterlife 
by this creature. Uh, and you can see this on walls of, of uh, pyramids. They've got this dog, alligator, um, hippopotamus type creature about to eat the Pharaoh's heart if he was evil. And so Moses is using language that is convicting the Pharaoh based on their own beliefs that Pharaoh is evil. He's hardened his heart against God. But who who hardened Pharaoh's heart first? Pharaoh did. And then God completed the process. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter one, basically, that if you suppress the truth long enough, God is going to give you up to your own desires and you are going to become a heart against him and you're going to be given up and be separated from God forever. So he's not talking about individual salvation here. He's talking about the election of the nation of Israel and God can use whom he wants to do so. This passage is not saying Pharaoh's in hell. That's not what this is about. This has to do with God using people on earth based on their own free will to get his purpose done. And if God hardens his heart because Pharaoh hardens his heart first, God can do that. He does that in Romans chapter one. Now, let me just complete the whole circle here. How, do, how can we be sure that the election spoken of in Romans 9 is election of the nation of Israel. You've got to keep reading. By the time you get to chapter 11, here's what Paul says uh, regarding election. This is verse 28. It says, as far as the gospel is concerned, they, meaning Israel, the Israelites who have not accepted Jesus, they are enemies on your account, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. How can it be, ladies and gentlemen, that it says as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies? How can these people be the elect of God to eternal salvation if they are enemies as far as the gospel is concerned? Can't be. He's bifurcating the gospel and election, in other words, in chapter 11, which is pointing out that election in chapter 9 and chapter 11 is the election of the nation of Israel at, to, for God to work through. It is not the election of individuals to salvation. Otherwise, if it was, he wouldn't say, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. So that's mm -hmm. my short five-minute overview as to why Romans 9 does not apply to the election of individuals to salvation against their will. Well, still with my Calvinist hat on, you just had to run off to all these other texts and talk about rhinoceroses and instead of just sticking to the Romans chapter 9 text. And so obviously you're just using man's philosophy um, <laughs> when you're interpreting uh, Romans chapter 9 and I'm not, you know, we're just reading it for what it says. Uh, and I, I speak tongue in cheek, uh, obviously, right. but uh, th that's sometimes the kind of answers you'll get is, is like you're running off to other texts by what, by looking at the text that Paul is quoting from mm -hmm. Paul mm -hmm. quotes from like 13 different passages mm -hmm. in the old Testament right. in Romans chapter nine, you've got to go look at what they meant then uh, because Paul's not eisegeting the old Testament, is he? No, no, he no. Paul, yeah. Paul is quoting from Moses and look, a lot of people don't don't seem to understand that even all the plagues against uh, against Egypt were all slams on the Egyptian gods. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and the only way you could know that is if you knew something about Egyptian culture. Right. And 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 so you're you're taking information from outside the Bible to understand what the Bible means. Everybody does that. That's unavoidable. Yes. In fact, let, let let's use another uh, probably easier example, and that is why do we think that the sun is stationary and the earth's going around the sun. When Joshua says the sun stood still, well, isn't the sun standing still anyway? And the Bible says the sun rises and the sun sets. I'm just, look, I'm just reading the text as it says, the sun rises yeah. and the sun sets, but we know according to science, that's not the case. So are, is there a contradiction? Is God wrong here? No, what we realize is since we're using all of God's revelation, his natural revelation and his special revelation. We're using natural revelation to help us understand special revelation, the yep. Bible. And we're saying now, okay, God is speaking from an observational perspective that hmm. the Bible is speaking from an observational perspective. The sun rises and the sun sets. Look, we still do that today, Layton. I mean, yep. we're in an advanced scientific culture 
And if you turn on the TV tonight to watch the weather report, the meteorologist is going to say sunrise tomorrow at 642. He's not going to say earth rotation will become apparent <laughs> at 642, right? right? We operate from an observational perspective, and so did the writers of the Bible. So you, you're always using information from outside the text to understand the text. Yeah. Let me give it yeah. a, another quick example here. Sure. There, there's a there's you know, people always say, well, the, the literal interpretation is always the better interpretation. It, it, it can be, but sometimes it isn't. Like, for example, you know, you, you know the part in the Old Testament where uh, Saul is trying to track down David and David hides in the caves, caves of En Gedi. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes Saul at one point uh, goes into the cave in which David is hiding. And it says in the text that Saul went in to cover his feet. And if you read a literal translation, like, say, the New American Standard, it's going to mm -hmm. say he went in to cover his feet into the cave. Now, I have no idea what that means, right? Yeah. Until the translators figured out that cover your feet was a Hebrew idiom. It meant to urinate. Okay? Uh -huh. so, the, so the NIV took that phrase and said he went in to relieve himself. So... So the, the NIV, the nearly inspired version, version, which is a thought by thought translation rather than right, a right. literal translation, helps give you the truth better than, say, the New American Standard Version. But look, I don't know about you, but covering your feet does not sound like urination to me because <laughs> when I do that, I want to make sure I clear my feet. <laughs> right? But apparently they use the term cover your feet. And uh, the only way we could get the true meaning out of that is to know something about Hebrew idioms. We, so, yeah. so we're importing that into the text because it helps clarify the text. And so there's nothing wrong with doing that. Which is very relevant to yeah. Romans 9 because you've got the word hatred being used, which we mm -hmm. know from John 14, where he says, if you don't hate your mother and father, mm -hmm. uh, your loved ones, you cannot be my disciple. Well, that seems to fly in the face of the honor of your mother and your father, and That's we're right. supposed to love our enemies even. Uh, so how, how does that work? Well, you understand the idiom of the first century to say to hate someone means you're choosing this person over that person. So I've chosen Jacob to be mm -hmm. the seed through which the promise is fulfilled, not Esau. It has nothing to do with whether Esau is going to be damned for all of eternity or not. That's it right. has to do with the fact that he's chosen the little brother to serve the older. I mean, the mm -hmm. older to serve the younger. Uh, and so th th those kinds of idioms need to be understood. And I love the parallelism uh, within the verse as well, because the parallel of, of Pharaoh being hardened, raised up for the very purpose of dem demonstrating God's power through Pharaoh so as to bring about the first Passover is very similar to what's happening in Paul's day where Israel is being hardened. Israel has been raised up yes. to demonstrate the power of God through the second Passover. And so it's through the hardening of Pharaoh that the first Passover is brought about in the same way it's through the hardening of Israel, ironically enough, mm -hmm. to bring about the real Passover. Oh, yeah, that's good. There's the, always the parallels, parallel. isn't there? It's amazing yeah. how the scriptures are so interconnected, despite the fact they're written by 40 people in different times in different places over 1,500 years. You know, well, that's what and, you know, that's what truth does. Yeah. yeah. And then Paul says in the very first verse uh, where he introduces the gospel in uh, Galate, am I sorry? In uh, Romans chapter three, verse twenty, where he says that he's passed over the sins previously committed. Right. So he's using that word Passover there, because Christ really is the Passover Lamb. So it's all yeah. interconnected. It's amazing how it how it's such a tapestry, but you have to make these connections in order to figure out what's going on, particularly here in Romans nine. And when you look at Romans nine, you understand that. You understand what hardening means, how it comes from the Egyptian culture. And when you understand that election doesn't always mean election to individuals to salvation, but the election of the nation of Israel. And it's confirmed when you get to Romans chapter 12. That's why I say there are no verses in the Bible. you got to read the whole text to figure it out. Then you can say, OK, this Romans 9 passage has nothing to do with choosing people to salvation against their will. No. Well, F Frank, I, I could talk to you all day long about this. Um, and I've been pleasantly, I don't know, surprised. I'm not really surprised uh, at all. I, I, I've always been impressed with uh, your scholarship, but so, 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 so many, so much of the time when I'm talking to apologists, they tend not to be a, as big on the theological concepts within the scripture. And that doesn't seem to be the case with you. It seems to me that your, your theology is very important to, to drive your apologetic methodology. 
Um, and and so maybe maybe talk to the audience, those in the audience who may be interested, uh, obviously in sociology, they're here, but they may also be interested in how that can be used in apologetics. And if they want to get involved in apologetics and the importance of apologetics, why don't you talk to them about that? Well, I think it's very important to retain what we all seem to sense is true that we have free will. Uh, in fact, let me say this. The Calvinists, in my view, run into the same problem the atheists and materialists do. Right. How, how do we how can we even reason if we don't have free will? <laughs> you know, how can yeah. how, how can we follow the evidence where it leads if every thought I have is completely controlled by the laws of physics? You know what this also means, by the way? That the law, if, if, if the atheist materialists, materialists are true and the hard five point Calvinists are right about this, then everything we do is the result of the laws of physics, which means everything from um, everything from Beethoven to computers to um, the great evils done in the history of the world have all been done by the laws of physics. Hmm. Does that make any sense? No, yeah. no, no more so than that it's yeah. being done by a sovereign decree of God either, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. the eternity past. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that we, the fact that we retain free will and divine sovereignty thinking this way allows us to answer apologetic questions, which with much more power and much more clarity and much more truth, because look, mm. the biggest, the biggest argument against the Christian worldview for most is the problem of evil. That's yeah. it, right? If there is a good God, why does he allow evil in the world? So as soon as people say that, you got to say, first of all, what do you mean by evil? Because evil doesn't exist unless good exists and good doesn't exist unless God exists. So evil yeah. doesn't disprove God. It actually shows that God does exist. Evil may prove there's a devil. It doesn't disprove God. But if you're a hard five point Calvinist and you're going to say that when you're asked the question, why does evil exist? You got to say, it's just a mystery. Right. Yeah. That's what you got to say, because if God does everything, why doesn't he do everything to make us choose the good? And if God wants all to be saved and some aren't saved and God does everything, why aren't some saved? Even though he said he wants all to be saved. It must be that there's this other truth or reality out there that human beings have free will to either grieve the Holy Spirit or accept what the Holy Spirit does and that's it tries to convict us of sin so mm -hmm. i think you can answer questions much much more robustly if you take the proper view of soteriology if you take the proper view of god's sovereignty and man's free will if not mm -hmm. you're really at a loss you really got to re resort to what rc Sproul resorted to and that is well it's just a mystery no it's not a mystery yeah. it's a contradiction yeah uh, and well, I say well that being a great fan of R.C. Sproul, I just think when he got to that point, in fact, in fact, we have a mutual friend who is a Calvinist who's, who, who mm -hmm. has said this, and I think he's right about it. Virtually all trained philosophers are not Calvinists. Mm -hmm. R.C. Sproul was the great exception to that. Anybody trained in philosophy, and we're not talking about vain philosophy here, when I define philosophy as right thinking about reality, Anybody who is trained in epistemology, ontology, and, and ethics from a philosophical perspective, logic, can't accept Calvinism. It makes no sense uh, from a, uh, a philosophical perspective. It, it, it results in contradiction. Yeah, and it, I, I think, I, I don't know the exact studies, but I've heard people cite that uh, you know many of the philosophers within the secular world are determinist to some degree the fit you know oh, uh, yeah, i'm talking about christians yeah christian christian philosophers yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, mass the mass number of christian philosophers yeah. um are, are are free will advocates in other yes. words and so um well i, I want our, our audience as we close to know a little bit more about how to get a hold of you or how to follow yeah. your ministry i know you're traveling a lot and uh, you're doing a lot of work and i know you've written several books so tell our audience a little bit more about how they can get a hold of you or get to know more about you Sure. If they go to crossexamined.org, that's crossexamined with a D on the end of it.org, it'll show you all the things we're doing. We do have a pretty robust uh, uh, YouTube uh, ministry. It's crossexamined, two words there. It's linked to on the website. I've written uh, several books. One is called I don't, have, I don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Another is called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And it deals with this free will issue, by the way, because I, I point out how the atheistic determinists make reason impossible 
if there if there is no free will because again they're just molecules in motion they're just moist robots so how can they even mm-hmm. get to valid conclusions if they can't follow the evidence where it leads uh, we have a TV show we have a podcast called I don't have enough faith to be an atheist and if they want to hear more about my thoughts on this Calvinism issue uh, I did a podcast I haven't done it in a while but it's it's August 2018 if they download our free app uh, uh, cross-examined in the app store. They can go back in the archives and listen to the August 2018 Predestination Free Will edition. Also, my son and I um, have just written a new book. He's also a seminary grad, although he's in the Air Force right now. Um, it's called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. It comes out May 3rd. And if people go to hollywoodheroesbook.com, they can see about it. And this is a book that will help get your kids more interested in Christianity and even people who are just interested in movies might get more interested in Christianity because we go largely through the superhero genre. Uh, we go through Captain America, Iron Man, uh, Star Wars. We go through uh, Batman, Wonder Woman, Lord of the Rings, a few others. And we point out that the all, all those heroes in those movies are pointing to the ultimate hero, Jesus. And in the text, we try and give them good biblical life lessons, philosophy, apologetic lessons, theology, those kind of things. So it's a good way to use movie night to try and and without sounding like the church lady give your kids the kind of of training they need so if if anyone pre-orders the book by may 3rd they get the audiobook for free in fact they can get the audiobook right away just go to hollywoodheroesbook.com and check it out there so that's what we're doing we go to colleges high schools and churches if anyone wants us to come to their high school their college or their church just go to crossexamine.org click on contact us and we'll figure out a way to get there I don't know. It sounds like maybe I'm, I'm trying to flatter Frank because he's my guest. It, it, that's not the case. I'd say this behind his back as well. Um, he is one of the best at presenting uh, a strong, uh, sound, logical case for Christianity in a way that uh, that youth can understand it and co- especially college students will engage with it. Um, and he uses just like uh, at the beginning of the show with the little buttons, he has he has slide presentations. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Um, it's right there. During his during his onstage presentation, he has slides and video clips that that he integrates through his presentations. I, I've never been bored in any of Frank's presentations, and I've heard some of his presentations several times uh, uh, several times over the years because I've, I've traveled. Uh, he, we invite him to our unapologetic conference, and so I've heard the same presentation a few times. And I'm still like looking forward to go seeing it again because he just does such a good job engaging with the audience. And so I, I appreciate so much your ministry and what you're doing. We need so many more like you on the front lines, helping to engage this, this culture that is uh, questioning uh, the existence of God and, and examining other faiths and going all kinds of directions. Uh, we need strong um, apologists like yourself on the front line, really standing firm for giving an evidence uh, to the, to the faith that we hold. And so I appreciate your ministry so much, Frank, and thank you so much for the time you've given today. I really do appreciate that. Well, thanks. That means a lot. Cause you freely said that. If God determined me to say it, it's just like, well, no, I guess God made you say that. That's so. right. Well, <laughs> that would be that. the case then. That would be, maybe that would be a better compliment. It's coming straight from God. It's it's just straight from God. You what to but do but of course, but of course the atheist video that just came out yesterday against you also was just as determined by God. That's true. That's oh, my word. So it. yeah, hey, it doesn't I, work I, that way. I, I guess it does. I guess we are chosen, but free Leighton. Maybe. Hey, maybe uh-huh. so. Uh-huh. Well, hang on, brother. I got this outro and then I want to talk to you just for right, one good. second. God bless you, brother. Go now, share Christ and show love. Bye-bye. <laughs>